Hey Noche, it's time to talk about electron configurations and orbitals. What do you think? So let's talk a little bit about orbitals and about electron configurations. First off, atomic orbitals. What are these again and where do they come from? Well, an orbital is just a function that describes the motion of a single electron. And we get the idea of orbitals really from solving the electronic Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, which is the only atom we can exactly solve with quantum mechanics, sadly. So for hydrogen atom, um, oh, I see Onyx is joining me there. Hey, Onyx. Good kitty. The Hamiltonian is just kinetic plus potential, and the potential is just Coulomb's law. And so the Hamiltonian acts on the wave function to give the wave function back times the energy. And the wave function, I'll put three subscripts on uh, because I have these three quantum numbers or, or integers that describe the uh, state of the system. And um, the energy uh, also I'll have a subscript on uh, because they have different solutions and they have different energies. And the wave function, I'm running it in spherical polar coordinates. So here we're invoking the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. We're freezing the nucleus, which is just a proton for a hydrogen atom, uh, at the origin. And then we're solving for the motion of the electron around the nucleus. And so spherical polar coordinates seem appropriate. And the wave function is just a function of r, the radius, with two subscripts, n and l, times y, l, m of theta and phi. And these are the so-called spherical harmonic functions, and they're complex functions. Uh, and so you have an angular part times a radial part. And the energies, um, which depend on this integer n, are this, kind of a combo of um, different physical constants, the mass of the electron, the charge on the electron, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, h bar. You notice it's proportional to one over n squared. So as n gets bigger and bigger, then the energy uh, has a bigger and bigger denominator and approaches zero. They're negative because uh, electrons like to be hanging out around protons. And uh, so therefore, uh, you have a negative energy, meaning it's stabilized. Zero would mean the electron was infinitely far away from the proton. And I could rearrange things if I want to introduce the Bohr radius A0 uh, and get a different way to write it, but it's the, the same quantity. So these are where your basic idea of orbitals come from, from hydrogen atom. Uh, who's to say that these orbitals are... Uh, good shapes to think about for other atoms. Well, it turns out we have some experience that they are uh, basically good to think about for other atoms, but um, but uh, they're, they're no longer exact solutions um, for any other atom. They only are really exact for a hydrogen atom. Okay, so here's a plot of some of the hydrogen atom orbitals. Here we're just plotting the angular part, okay? Um, the S function is spherically symmetric. Um, the P functions have directionality to them, so they can point along, say, the X or, or Z or Y direction. Uh, I think these are maybe mislabeled. These look to me like PX and PZ and PY because they're pointed along those directions. Uh, but this does give me a chance to mention uh, what I uh, said a second ago, that the pure solutions to the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom involve spherical harmonics, and those are complex functions. Complex functions, of course, are harder to plot, harder to deal with. Most computational chemistry programs use real functions, px, py, pz. Um, but, um, you know, you, you can transform between the two representations. You can take plus and minus combinations of the spherical harmonics to get to these real functions, and I, it looks like the real ones that we're actually plotting here. Notice for the p functions, there's an 
I'll call it an angular node. Uh, so there are certain angles at which um, the wave function goes to zero. And if you remember psi star psi is the probability of finding the electron, any place that psi is zero, psi star psi will also be zero. And so there's a node of a certain set of angles. Here it's a plane, really. Uh, in this one, the px orbital, the yz plane, is an entire plane where um, for any of those angles that put you on that plane, you'll have a zero wave function and therefore a zero probability of finding the electron there. And p orbitals are characterized by this nodal plane. And it just, the plane just shifts depending on which direction the p orbital is pointing in. Um, and so say the, the lighter lobe might be, say, positive and the darker lobe might be negative. The orbitals have a sign to them now. Um, and we'll talk more about the sign in a minute. D uh, orbitals, uh, most of these have four lobes instead of two. And you can see most of them look equivalent to each other. It just depends on which axes they lie between. This one's a little different. Um, this you might call the D z squared orbital, which I think is the same as d0, so that's good. Um, but then the other ones all uh, are kind of like, almost like a pair of two p orbitals or something. And again, the different colors denote different signs. So the lighter lobes are a certain sign and the darker lobes are the opposite sign. Um, so there are five d functions. Um, f orbitals, you can see there's a set of seven of those and they look kind of like more complex d orbitals. So they have even more lobes. And again, they have two signs, plus and minus, and you alternate as you go around. This one, the f0, would, could also be called an fz cubed orbital. And it looks like a generalization of this uh, dz squared orbital. Okay, now that's just the angular part of these. Um, but let me see if I've mentioned all this already. Well. The shape depends on the angular momentum L. So if L equals zero is spherically symmetric, that's that S orbital we looked at. If L equals one, you have one angular node, that's a P orbital, there's a set of three of those. If L equals two, and then you have two angular nodes, there are two planes uh, that when you cross through them, the sign changes. Uh, and uh, there's a set of five of these D orbitals. L equals three. Uh, is an f orbital, ha has three angular nodes, and there's a set of seven of those, and you could keep on going. You could have g orbitals and h orbitals and so on and so forth. Um, the direction that the orbital is pointing in um, is determined by the quantum number m sub l, and m sub l can go from minus l up to plus l in steps of one. So for the p orbitals, you could have m sub l minus one or zero or one. For D, you can have minus two, minus one, zero, one or two, et cetera, et cetera. And I already mentioned, uh, although that's what comes out of the Schrodinger equation, these YLM spherical harmonics, we take plus and minus combinations and turn them into real functions uh, so that we can plot them and look at them and analyze them and code them up in a computer program in an easier way. Okay, so. I already pointed out the light and dark regions on those angular plots, and I said that those correspond to a sign change as you go from one lobe to the other. Um, and let me now elaborate on that and say that the, the minus of an orbital, so suppose you took a p orbital and you multiplied it by minus one, and you swapped which one was the light lobe and which one was the dark lobe, say, or the positive lobe and the minus lobe, would that change the orbital? In a mathematical sense, yes. In a, in a, in a physical sense, no. Uh, the sign on an orbital doesn't matter, and this goes for atomic orbitals or later on molecular orbitals. Um, the fact that the sign changes when you go from one region of an orbital to another, that matters, okay? Uh, so the fact the sign changes within an orbital matters, but the overall sign doesn't matter. And that's because the probability of finding an electron at point r is psi star of r times psi of r. And so then suppose you multiply psi by minus one. Well, when you evaluate this probability, each of these pieces would be multiplied by minus one and the minuses would cancel and it wouldn't matter. So the probability is unaffected uh, 
if you multiply psi of r by minus 1. And that's why I'm saying the sign doesn't matter. Uh, and I've already pointed out, anytime psi goes to 0, then the probability also goes to 0. And so you won't find the particle there. And if there are certain uh, angles or certain radii at which a psi goes to 0, we'll call those nodes. Um, so let's talk about the radial nodes, because we've already talked about the angular nodes. There are certain radii for certain orbitals, at least in hydrogen atom, where you get a zero probability of finding the electron. So here's a picture that tries to capture this. Um, here's a 1s orbital. Uh, it's a very tiny blue dot, so it has no radial nodes. But if you go to a 2s orbital, you get a, a, a portion of the of the electron density near the nucleus, which is a tiny blue dot there right in the center of that. And then you get our yellow region. And there's a sign change. So, you know, blue denotes, say, positive, and yellow denotes, say, negative, or vice versa. It doesn't matter. But you get a sign change as I go from very, very close to the nucleus where it's blue, then to outside that area where it turns yellow. And when the sign changes, that's a radius at which uh, psi goes to zero, and therefore psi star psi goes to zero, and therefore there's zero probability of finding the electron right at that radius. Um, if you look at the 3s, then I see two radial nodes, because I start off in the middle, it's very tiny so it's hard to see, but the middle of that is blue, and then I go a little further out and I go to yellow, so that was one sign change. And then I go a little further out, and then it's blue again. So that's a second sign change. So there are two radii at which I get radial nodes for a 3s. And then if I look at the 4s, there's yet another radial node, because now I go blue to yellow to blue to yellow. And so I switch sign once as I go blue to yellow, second as I go, two as I go from yellow to blue, and then three times as I go back to yellow. So there are three radial nodes, and you can see there's a pattern here, right? Uh, this one had no radial nodes, now I have one, now I have two, now I have three. So every time my principal quantum number, n, uh, increases from one to two, three to four, if I look at the s orbitals, then I get one more radial node every time. Look at the p orbitals. Well, there's an angular node, uh, so there's a plane in which there's no probability of finding the electron. Uh, but there's not a radial node because uh, there's no radius at which uh, psi goes to zero. Um, unless you count r equals zero, but that, that's a special case. So we're not going to count that. Uh, but now look if I go to a, a 3p orbital, this one. Here I've maintained the angular node, so it's still true that if I slice right through the middle, uh, I get a zero probability. But um, now, if I start heading north uh, or up from um, the center, uh, I am in this blue lobe. But then if I keep going, I'm in a yellow lobe. So I got a sign change. And um, I see that the same thing happens in the opposite direction. And where that sign change is, is spherically symmetric. It's actually a radius at which I won't find the electron. So that's a radial node. And then if I look at a 4p, I get a second radial node. I get the first one I already saw here, um, which is here now. And then uh, I get a second one that's out a little further. Um, so you can see the pattern is the same. Every time I go up and in, I get another radial node. But for p's, I don't get the first one until principal quantum number three. Uh, whereas for S's, I get the first one at principal quantum number two. Here's an F, a D orbital, I mean. Um, here's a 3D orbital. There are no uh, radial nodes here. There's no radius at which you always go to zero. Uh, but for a 4D, there is. There's uh, this radius here where the sign will change if I go from inside to outside that radius. Um, so. In general, the formula is n minus l minus 1 is how many radial nodes you have. So let's check that for 3d, for example. n equals 3, l equals 2, 3 minus 2 is 1, minus 1, 0 radial nodes. There are no radial nodes for this one, so that's correct. But then if I increase n by 1, uh, 
I get one radial node. So that's the formula. Now what about atoms that aren't hydrogen atom? Well, everything goes out the window because all these wonderful orbitals I've just shown you uh, are valid for hydrogen atom, but um, their only um, ideas or inspiration for other atoms. Uh, for other atoms, what you really need to do is solve a multi-electron electronic Schrodinger equation and get multi-electron wave functions. And in general, those will look like a combination of multiple Slater determinants. Uh, so they're, they're just complicated. There are no one electron functions that pop out of solving the Schrodinger equation unless it's hydrogen atom. Nevertheless, the concept of s orbitals and p orbitals and d orbitals does remain useful and at least sort of qualitatively correct for multi-electron atoms. So we won't dispense with them entirely. Um, now, let me mention, except for hydrogen atom, there's not a simple analytic formula for what the energy levels are either. So for hydrogen atom, you remember we had uh, E sub n equals and some physical constants and then one over n squared. And th there just isn't a formula like that for helium or lithium or carbon or whatever your favorite other element is. Um, it's a quirk of hydrogen atom that the 2s and 2p orbitals have the same energy because in hydrogen atom the energy only depends on n. It doesn't depend on L, the angular momentum. For other atoms, uh, it does matter what L is. And generally speaking, your 2s orbital is lower in energy than your 2p. And likewise, 3s is generally lower than 3p. So um, that is true in general uh, and not for hydrogen atom because hydrogen atom is a special case as far as that goes. So now let me remind you of the Aufbau principle. This is something that's usually taught in freshman chemistry. Uh, but it's uh, good to get a quick reminder of how this works, and then we'll talk about how this generalizes beyond atoms in, in a few moments. Um, so first off, for atoms, we're going to pretend that the atom is described by electrons going in orbitals. Uh, we know that's not entirely true because the real wave function is some complicated multi-electron wave function. Then, if we are going to assume that, we have to know what orbitals do I put the electrons in. Well, you use the Aufbau principle, which is German for filling up principle. You fill up the orbitals, starting with the lowest energy ones first. And in general, the energies of the orbitals go like this. 1s is less than 2s, is less than 2p, is less than 3s, is less than 3p, is less than 4s, is less than 3d. So we skipped our principal quantum number here. I had a 4 and then I went back to 3. And then I go back to 4, 4p, then to 5s, then to 4d, then to 5p, etc., etc. Eventually get to f's when you talk about lanthanides and actinides. I will uh, skip those for now. It's easy to remember this pattern. You don't have to really memorize this. If you got access to a handy dandy periodic table and you just sort of walk the periodic table and you understand how the periodic table works, then the periodic table will tell you these rules. So let me explain that to you. Now, if I make a list of how many electrons are in each orbital, that list is called the electron configuration. So I want to do some examples of writing down electron configurations, which again, some of you might have already learned in freshman chemistry, but you might not have thought about that for a while. And finally, I'll also remind you each spatial orbital like an s orbital or a 2py orbital, can hold two electrons, one alpha electron, one beta electron. You can't put in two alpha electrons to the same spatial orbital. That would be forbidden by the Pauli principle. All right, so let's walk across the periodic table and see how this works. Suppose I had hydrogen atom, and I wanted to know the electron configuration. Well, that one's going to be a very easy one. Um, Hydrogen atoms up in the upper left, and I see that I'm in this red zone. It's color-coded red to tell me I'm in an S block, and that tells me as I'm walking across these elements in this block, I'm going to put electrons in S orbitals. So for hydrogen atom, uh, well, there's only one electron. Uh, I'm already at my end point when I start, 
And so since there's one electron, um, and the number of electrons is, is equal to the number of protons because the atoms are neutral, and that, the number of protons is just the atomic number. So I can just look at the number on the element. Here there's one electron, uh, and um, so I put it in a 1s orbital. It's s block, so it's an s orbital. And so the electron configuration is 1s. Some people might say 1s1, uh, but that's it. Okay, that's too easy. Let's do another one. How about helium atom? Well, helium atom, now I'm going to do this walking across the table. So I start here, put a first electron in a 1s, and then I go over here, and I put a second electron in a 1s. This one's also color-coded red. He's over here on the periodic table because he wants to hang out with his fellow noble gases, but he's still red. So I put a second electron in the 1s orbital, and that gives me 1s2 configuration. There are two electrons in the 1s orbital. Okay. Again, too easy. How about something else? Carbon atom. Okay, this will be more interesting. So I'm going to start walking, starting at hydrogen. First electron goes in 1s. Second electron goes in 1s. Third electron now needs to go in an s, but the 1s orbital is filled, so I put it in a 2s orbital. So um, th that's fine. Beryllium, I need another electron in an s orbital. 2s can hold one more. So now I filled 1s from the first row, and then from lithium and beryllium, I filled 2s, but I keep going because I'm not at carbon yet. So now I start putting electrons in p uh, orbitals because I'm in the p block now, this yellow block. So I've got a first electron that I put in a p orbital. Now I've got a second electron that I put in a p orbital. And now I stop because I'm at carbon and I was asking about carbon. So uh, in total, I had 1s2 from the first row, 2s2 from lithium and beryllium, and now I landed on carbon, and there, I'm 2 into the p block, so it's 2p2. And that's my electron configuration. Okay. How about something more challenging? How about titanium? That'll get me down here, element number 22. So there's 22 electrons. Uh, well, I start walking up here again at the top. So 1s gets two electrons in it. 2s gets two electrons in it. 2p is filled with all six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, then I drop back down here, so I'm on the 3s and it's filled. And then I go over here and the 3p is also filled with six electrons. Then I go over here, I put two electrons in the 4s. And then as you jump over to the transition metals, you um, drop in principal quantum number. Remember, you go from 4s to 3d. So there are two electrons left, and they go in a 3d orbital. Uh, and so the final configuration is 1s2 from the first row. From the second row, I get 2s2, 2p6. From the third row, I get 2s2, 3p6. And from the fourth row, I get 4s2, and then 3d2. There's two electrons left that go into the d block in blue. And hopefully you can see how this would generalize as I would go even further down into the periodic table. There are some special cases. So if you have a filled or half-filled subshell, uh, a D or F subshell, those are extra stable. And they're so stable, sometimes these half-filled or filled D or F shells will steal an electron from what's nominally a lower energy orbital just so that they can become filled or half filled. Uh, so for example, chromium um, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 2, uh, 2p6, etc, etc. It gets tedious to keep repeating the 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, etc, etc. So sometimes as a shorthand in square brackets we'll put the nearest uh, noble gas to me, above me in the periodic table. So here this means an argon core. It means the same electron configuration as argon, uh, which in this case would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2, 3p6, but it's easier to say argon core. And then that leaves me then in the fourth row. So instead of 4s2, 3d4, which is what you would think it would be, it steals an electron out of the lower energy 4s orbital, pops it into the 3d, so that this can become half filled. The d's, because there's five of them, can hold a, ten, a total of 10 electrons, 
And so 3D5 is half filled and that's one of these special cases. Likewise, anything below chromium in the periodic table does the same thing, just with uh, adjusted electron configurations. Um, and then similarly, zinc um, is an argon core and it fills the 3D subshell by stealing an electron out of 4S. Uh, so it would have been 4S2 3D5, but it's not. It completes the 3D subshell by taking an electron out of 4S and giving me this configuration. And uh, same thing happens for anything below zinc in the periodic table. Um, let me mention the concept of a spin orbital configuration. Uh, this gives you a little more detail than a straight up spin configuration, and it just tells you what's the spin on those electrons. So for example, on hydrogen atom, uh, before I said 1s, now I'll say it's 1s alpha. And there's just kind of an unwritten rule among chemists, chemists and physicists that by convention, you'll pick alpha instead of beta. Beta is equally good, okay? One spin up, alpha spin up, beta spin down. There's nothing inherently better about spin up than spin down. But by convention, if we have unpaired spins and we have some choice about being arbitrary and being able to pick one, then we'll just pick alpha. So that's why I picked alpha. Um, helium atom used to be 1s2. If you wanted to spell it out, you could say 1s alpha and 1s beta. Um, and again, because of the Pauli principle, uh, one has to be up and one has to be down. Lithium atom um, would be 1s2, 2s1, now becomes 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha. Again, picking alpha preferentially just by convention. All right, so for carbon atom, we had 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. But what about the spin orbital configuration? So let's draw a diagram. We've got the 1s orbital doubly occupied with two electrons. We've got the 2s orbital doubly occupied with two electrons. What happens to these two p's? Well, I've got three p orbitals that all have the same energy. It doesn't matter if I have p minus one, p zero, or p plus one, or in this case, I've shown px, py, or pz. They have the same energy as each other. So how do I know what orbitals to put these two electrons in? Um, yeah, what about the two p two? Well, remember Hund's rule. So Hund's rule says, start putting electrons in equal energy orbitals um, where I don't pair them up. Keep putting in, we'll pick alpha spins normally, keep putting alpha spins in them as far across as you can until every orbital that has the same energy has an alpha spin electron in it. And then if you have more electrons, go back and start putting in beta spin orbitals and pair them up. So here I've got one, two electrons and that's all I have. It's a 2p2 configuration. So I'm done. Uh, Hun's rule tells me that ought to be the configuration. And um, so then if I wanted the spin orbital configuration, it'd be 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha, 2s beta. And you could pick x, y, and z in any order or minus one, zero, plus one in any order. That doesn't matter. Um, but I'll just name them X, Y, and Z, and I'll say X, Alpha, Y, Alpha. By the way, in a computational chemistry program, um, in principle, you should get the same answer if you were to force occupation of, say, PX and PY, and, and if you reran the calculation and then put them in X and Z, or Y and Z, any combo of those ought to give you the same answer and if your program uh, knows about spatial symmetry, sometimes you can force populations in either the X or the Y, depending on the symmetry of those orbitals, and giving the number of or, uh, electrons per irreducible representation, and it shouldn't matter. You should get the same answer. All right, so here's a perfectly valid spin orbital configuration for carbon atom. Um, 
Now, because I have unpaired electrons, we'll call this an open shell case. Closed or when you have things paired up all uh, paired up with alphas and betas. Uh, but this is an open shell. And I've already mentioned we normally pick alphas uh, if, um, if everything is equal uh, by convention. And so this is the so-called high spin case where all the spins are pointing up.